very much, and I love that pounding bass. Can we just keep that up the whole um, time? So uh, it's very good afternoon. It's great to be here. And uh, really, there's four things I want to say to you about how we use drugs today. It's a drug pill container, and how we will use them in the future. And I think it's good news. So I'm, the four things, and I'm going to start off with the first one, uh, the kind of lessons. The first one is people do not respond to drugs in the same way. Anybody who's taken a medication may have an inkling about this. Uh, I'm a physician. I have a clinic uh, on Friday afternoons. I go, I did it uh, yesterday, and I see patients, and they sometimes have needs for medications, and I, I do the best that I can, my medical training, my understanding of science, my understanding of patient preferences about drugs. I make a decision, and I really hope those drugs are going to work. But really, at the end of the day, it's, it very often is a hope and we'd like to be a little bit more rational about that. Uh, we'd like to do a little bit of a better job. So let me take one drug that we'll be talking about today. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go throughout the talk. It's uh, Tylenol number 3. It's the drug that I thought had the biggest chance of being taken by the most of you. Uh, it's also very ironic because I've had a cold and I have a cough. I may cough during this talk. Codeine is an excellent, excellent cough medication. But it also makes you loopy and totally unable to stick to any kind of timed presentation. So Tylenol number three, it's Tylenol, uh, that's acetaminophen, that's all over the place. The magical part of Tylenol number three is the number three part. That's codeine. Now codeine is a wonderful drug. It is in the opiate family. <clears throat> that is, to remind, to remind you of some of the other members of the opiate family, that includes morphine, uh, Vicodin, fentanyl, for those of you who are real connoisseurs. It, and, <laughs> And it also includes illegal drugs such as heroin, all in the same family, all extremely good at relieving pain, and in, in high enough doses also creating uh, a sensorium that is quite unusual and in some ways, I am told, pleasant. <laughs> so um, when, when we use Tylenol number three for minor procedures. We use it for when somebody's getting their tooth uh, pulled, or if they've had a, a skin biopsy, or a, a root canal, or all these kinds of things where uh, you can get a prescription and, and maybe you have. Uh, the problem is we don't all respond the same. So the ideal would be we take the codeine, it relieves our pain, we remain functional, everything is good. But unfortunately, some people get uh, actually no pain relief at all. Other people might get pain relief, but they can't tell because they mostly have constipation. <laughs> In fact, you could say that codeine is a constipation drug that also treats pain. Um, <clears throat> And, and other people have just funny, uh, loopy thoughts and kind of act weird, but really don't get a lot of pain relief. Uh, why do we respond differently to these drugs? And there's a number of reasons. As a physician, when I write a prescription, I know that one of the biggest determinants of whether the drug will work for the patient is whether they actually fill the prescription and take the medication. And I know that a large, and this has been studied, a large percent of people say, thank you very much, doc. They take the prescription on the way out, they throw it in the wastebasket. And then I come back and I say, hey, did that codeine work for you? Uh, no, it didn't work for me. Uh, did you take the codeine? No, I didn't take the codeine. <laughs> Probably number one. Uh, there's other things, like what's in your stomach. You, you always know that when you get these medications, right, sometimes you're told, uh, take it with food, and other times you said, don't, whatever you do, don't take it with food, and this is our best efforts to kind of get a predictable uh, drug levels in your blood based on the chemistry of these drugs. It also depends, your drug response, on what other drugs you might be taking, because they can do funny things to each other and have synergistic effects or antagonistic effects. Um, but another reason, and the one I want to talk about today, is your body has molecules, in, your, your body is made out of molecules, uh, and those, some of those molecules, especially some molecules in your liver, in your kidneys, uh, are, are um, involved in processing the drugs. And those molecules can be a little bit different in different people. And so those differences can cause differences in response to drugs. So I need to tell you a little bit about these two processes about how, drugs, how drug response works. The first is what the body does to the drug. When you take a drug, it's absorbed, distributes throughout your body, absorbed through the intestine, distributed throughout the body, starts being metabolized. You've evolved over the last couple of hundred thousand, really millions of years, systems in your liver and your kidney to identify foreign substances and basically get rid of them, because in general, they're not good. We are giving them because we've learned that they can be beneficial. 
Um, this is called, it's called pharmacokinetics. That's not very important, except the kinetics part is the movement, the movement of the drug through the body and eventually out. There are molecules involved in the pharmacokinetics, and little differences in those molecules can mean that, for example, it gets from your intestine into your bloodstream faster or slower. And then I don't think it's hard to believe that you might have a different response to that drug. It gets to the liver, and if there's differences in those liver molecules, maybe some of us metabolize the drug more quickly to make it inactive or to make it active, and others are more slowly. So that's the pharmacokinetics or what the body does to the drug. The second part of pharmacology, and by the way, this is all of pharmacology, I don't know why we take so much time to teach it to medical students, is pharmacodynamics, how the drug actually changes the dynamics, how it changes what's going on in your physiology in your body. And that has to do with the, with the drug floating around your bloodstream, but eventually reaching what we call its target, the molecule in your body that it was meant to interact with to modify the physiology to kind of help you. So if it's a blood pressure medicine, it's going to modify, it's going to bind to a molecule that's involved in blood pressure, and hopefully the blood pressure will go down because that molecule is not able to contribute in whatever way it does to blood pressure regulation that's a little bit out of whack. So for codeine, so that's pharmacodynamics, and what we'd like to know for every drug is the pharmacokinetics of that drug and all the molecules that matter, the pharmacodynamics of that drug and all the molecules that matter for that. So let's go back to our example, codeine. <clears throat> this is empty because, it, uh, not because I took all the codeine. Because <laughs> it would rattle and it would annoy the sound guys. Uh, so um, codeine, you take it, and if I gave you IV codeine, it's actually a placebo. There's no effect to, to codeine in the bloodstream. It must go to the liver, where there's this horribly named enzyme called CYP2D6. Uh, don't worry about it. But CYP2D6 does a chemical transformation on codeine that turns it into morphine. Okay? And that is active. That morphine goes to places in your brain that are involved with pain, with, uh, that are involved with uh, vivid dreams, that are involved with constipation. Those, those are also in your, in your colon. Uh, and does its thing. So you have to have that CYP2D6 do the transformation. And in fact, there are opioid receptors in the brain for the pharmacodynamics that bind the, uh, the opioid, the codeine, and, uh, the codeine that has now been turned into morphine, and do their thing. So that's uh, the PK and the PD, the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics in a, in a nutshell for codeine. Second lesson, and by the way, the lessons get shorter and shorter so we can finish on time. Second lesson, first lesson was we all respond differently to drugs. The second lesson is we inherit our response to drugs. Now, inheritance is genetics. That's what did you get from mom and dad and from all your, of your ancestors. And that's things like what we think of typically for genetics is we think about our eye color or our height or our skin color or our predisposition to diseases. But another thing that you inherit is how you respond to drugs. But the problem is, Unlike other traits, there's usually not a family lore about like how grandma responded to her coding, unless there's a great story. And in fact, coding is one of the few where there might be a great story. <laughs> but, but, but in general, you don't know even probably how your parents responded to a drug, and certainly not the family history of response to coding. Uh, and that's a problem for, for us who care, because we can't say, uh, has your family ever had problems with coding? So, sometimes, if you have anesthesia, sometimes we say, have you ever had problems with anesthesia? So, but the good news is that through the miracle of genome sequencing, DNA sequencing, we are now able to very cheaply measure people's DNA. And the DNA, it's not the only thing, but it is the primary thing you get from your parents biologically. There's other things that those of you who are biologists know about. But it's mostly about the DNA. And DNA is mostly the same across all humans, but not totally the same. There's about, um, it takes six billion DNA basis to specify a human, and about 0.3% of those, which sounds like a small number, but it's actually a lot of DNA, is different across the human population and is responsible for all the diversity that we see in humans, including their diversity in drug response. So let me tell you about codeine. So I told you about this liver, this liver enzyme, CYP2D6. It turns out that 7% of Europeans don't have an active version of this enzyme. They cannot European uh, descent people cannot convert codeine into morphine. So I write the prescription. Oh, you're having your tooth pulled. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, here's a prescription for Tylenol number three. Good luck to you. Get a call. This is the, this is the call. <laughs> Doc, I took the codeine and then I had, my, uh, I had my teeth pulled and I am in excruciating pain. 
So I can think two things. I can think one, oh my goodness, this person might be a CYP2D6 non-responder. Or I could think, this is a troublemaking drug seeker <laughs> who wants something stronger. Most doctors think the latter. I like to think that I think the former, but it is not routinely done in medicine. There's another variation floating around in the human population that is a super duper metabolizer. So CYP2D6 doesn't, even, doesn't just work, it works fantastically well. So these people love codeine because they take their codeine and instead of lasting four to six hours, it all gets turned into morphine in 20 minutes and they get like a hit of morphine. So they love codeine, but they call me up too. Doc, I, I thank you for the pill and I had the tooth extraction and I had the best half hour of my life <laughs> and then for four hours, I uh, was in excruciating pain. So what do I think? I could think, oh, this person must be a hyper metabolizer of CYP2D6, and I really used the wrong drug. Or I could think this is a troublemaking drug seeker who wants more <laughs> drugs. It's the final common pathway for all bitter uh, physicians. OK, so, so uh, this is the great example of how your genetics can uh, impact your drug response. So third point, at Stanford, we are building a database called the PharmGKB of all knowledge about how genetics impacts drugs. It's called the PharmGKB, and it has information about hundreds of drugs and hundreds of genes with similar stories about effects or toxicities that are modulated by these inherited DNA changes. We've even done experiments where we've taken in a whole human genome and predicted the response of the drug, uh, uh, the response of that human to hundreds of drugs, and we, are, we were Im impressed that this is not just one or two. Everybody has several drugs that you would expect an unusual or abnormal response to. So we're um, putting that database together, and this is gonna be the source, we hope, for a medicine, and this is where we get to the good news, where we are able to routinely do this in our practice. The fourth point, and last point, is that physicians want to use this information. There's been many surveys. Would you use genetics to prescribe drugs if you could? Are you interested? Yes, yes, yes. What's the problem? We don't have guidelines. We don't feel like we're educated. This is a new thing. We need help. So the other thing we're doing at Stanford in collaboration with an international um, consortium, it's called the Clinical Pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenetics is the terrible word for what I'm talking about, Implementation Consortium, CPIC, is we're writing and publishing easy to understand guidelines for physicians where we say, if you want to try to use genetics for drug response, here is the genetic test you would want to order, here's how to interpret it. We try to keep it informative, well-referenced, scholarly, but short and simple. We've written such guidelines, of course, for codeine, for cholesterol medications, for antidepressants, for cancer drugs, for arthritis drugs, for HIV drugs, and, and, and the list is growing and this is an active consortium. Slowly, one drug by drug, we're creating the literature that will allow us to implement this routinely in clinical practice. So the vision is that er, at, at birth, or at, perhaps at your 18th birthday, there will be a genome sequence or some sort of measurement of your genome that will go into a safe database who has access to it has to be worked out. We have to worry about privacy issues. I don't, I'm not going to talk about that, but it's a significant issue. And when your physician then prescribes a drug, instead of hoping, praying, using their best effort, that best effort will include looking at the genetics and making the decisions based on your inherited features that will impact your drug response. That's an exciting feature and an exciting future. It's one that we're looking forward to. It's one that I think you can expect to see in all of your lifetimes. Companies have been started, to use the passive voice, to do this, uh, and it's very exciting. <laughs> the other thing that uh, becomes possible is not just taking existing drugs and sorting them out exactly for which group should get them and which group shouldn't get them, but there's now the exciting possibility also of using our deep knowledge of the genetics of disease, of drug action, to design entirely novel, maybe even personalized drugs based on your particular genome. This is beginning to happen in cancer, and it may happen in other fields, but that would be a different TED Talk. So thank you very much.